Hi guys. Hi. Hi. So we've got um, a classroom from CMR and a classroom from Cup Bank today. So thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to have you guys. Um, my name is Amy Ryan. I'm the executive director of the Montana World Affairs Council. And um, we're the organization that's partnered with Inspired Classroom to bring you this um, lovely program. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based out of Missoula. Um, our mission is around international education and global awareness and bringing these kinds of opportunities to students like you guys around the state. So we're thrilled that you're joining us. Um, we have a very lovely speaker with us today. Her name is Elke Duer. And um, Elke is a binational filmmaker, conservationist, and educator, and the founder and director of the nonprofit Web of Life Foundation, which the acronym is WOLF. She teaches and lectures widely on the importance of predators in the ecosystem and the preservation of the web of life. Her documentary, Stories of Wolves, features the endangered Mexican gray wolves and the people who are not only working for their recovery, but who are also coexisting with them peacefully. At present, she is also working on a documentary about endangered wild bison. And actually, tonight, Elke will be showing her movie, The Stories of Wolves, here in Missoula. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. So without further ado, again, thank you for joining us, and Elke Dur. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. So let me ask you first, first off, um, who has ever seen a wolf in the wild? Anybody? Awesome. That's quite a few hands that are going up here. That's awesome. Because I'm asking because when I was about your age, I grew up in Germany, we didn't have any wolves in Germany at all. No large animals. No more moose, no more elk, no more wolves, no more lynx, uh, no more bears. People had killed them all off. And um, that's why I moved to the United States when I was about 22, so that I could be around wild animals because I've always loved them. And um, especially wolves have always been very dear to me. And uh, so right now, I live in New Mexico, but right now I'm up here in Montana. And I think it's very exciting that we, we here in Montana have so many wolves still in the wild. So is anybody still afraid of wolves? <laughs> yeah, anybody else? That's quite amazing because usually a lot more hands go up. So, um, and that's usually because of the stories we have heard around the wolves, right? Have you ever heard of um, any good stories about wolves? Or usually it's the bad wolf. Any good stories with a wolf? It's the good, uh, the big good wolf, or it's the big bad wolf. <laughs> no, not really. Okay. Well, anyways, at the moment, things have changed. The wolves are coming back. Where I grew up in Germany, we didn't have any wolves and uh, any large animals at all because there were so many people. Um, we have 83 million people in Germany, and Germany is the same size as Montana. Who knows how many people we have in Montana about? Do you have any idea? How many million? Yeah, million. <laughs> One million. So one million people in Montana, 83 million people on the same size land in Germany. So, but the good news is, right now in Germany we have about a hundred wolves again. They came back from uh, Poland. Do you have, have you, who has heard about um, Germany and Poland? Who knows about where uh, Europe is? Do you have an idea? Okay, great. And have you ever been to uh, Europe? Anybody has been to Europe? Awesome, cool. Yeah, so anyways, um, we had communism for a long time in the eastern part of Europe, and it was very divided between the east and the west, and there was a border uh, going through the middle and border, heavily guarded borders all around uh, the, uh, each country. So people couldn't cross and pass that easily. Um, and it also impacted the wildlife. Whenever a wolf tried to cross over, they would shoot it and not let it into the country, you know, kind of like a person. 
And so wildlife couldn't move a lot. Have you ever heard of a wildlife corridor? Anybody? Wildlife corridor? Any ideas of what that is? Wildlife corridor, we have one here uh, from the Yukon all the way down to Mexico. That's where animals uh, historically migrated. We also have the carnivore way along the Rocky Mountains where uh, larger carnivores migrate a lot, back and forth. So there's an interchange. They are not just uh, confined to small areas. They can move. And um, because often we have animals just in parks and we think they need to stay there, but large animals often need to move, and so uh, that's called a wildlife corridor. So we are on a big wildlife corridor, and we are very lucky to still have uh, wild animals around, like bears, like uh, wolves. What other large carnivores do you know in your area? What if we go to um, Cutbank? Cutbank, what, what large carnivores do you have in your area? <laughs> In our area? Yeah. Mountain lions. Grizzly bear. Yes, mountain lions. Mm-hmm. Yep. What other animals? Do you have any links? What did you say? It's not near us. I don't know. About 50 miles away. 50 miles away. 50 miles away? Okay. Do you have any wolves? Yeah, there's, yeah. Not often. A little bit. <laughs> okay. How about Great Falls? What large carnivores do you have in your area? Wolves? We have wolves, I think. <laughs> what was that? Hi. <laughs> The coyotes, yeah. Coyotes are omnivores. They also eat. Um, they they eat meat, but they also eat everything else. Do you have any links in your area? Yes. Mountain lions. Bobcat. Bobcat. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> still have a fairly intact ecosystem and have a lot of these animals still around. Does anybody have bison in their area? Wild bison? Yeah. Cut me. Yeah? Okay. That's another large animal. It's not a carnivore. It's an herbivore, but still it's one of the last large animals that we have. Probably one of the largest ones um, aside from the musk oxen. So um, we're really lucky to still have these animals around. And, um, and it's very important that we make space for them because what, what happens is when people move in, we have cattle, we have uh, dogs, we have domesticated animals, and often there's conflict between livestock and wild animals, right? And so in the past, we have taken out the wild animals in favor of the livestock. But now we are learning that everybody has, an, has, a, has a role in the ecosystem and that we can't just take anybody out because then something is missing. So have you ever heard of uh, traffic cascades? Anybody? How about, yeah? Yeah, how about cut bank? Have you ever heard of that? That term? Uh, it was in the video yesterday. No? Little. Okay. Yeah, how about um, Great Falls? Anybody? No? Scientists have now uh, done studies and proven that when you take, for example, a wolf out, it has a ripple effect down the ecosystem. It affects everything else. And when the wolves come back, it also affects everything else and the ecosystem becomes healthier and uh, animals come back. So, um, so it's very important that we preserve every single member of the ecosystem, that we can't just take anybody out and that um, it trickles down. For example, in um, Yellowstone Park, when the wolves came back, Everything else came back because what happened when there weren't any wolves, there were lots more elk, 
there were lots more deer and they were standing around and browsing everything. So they, um, they ate up the aspen and the grass and everything like that. So, um, so then birds were going away because they didn't have a place to nest and also coyotes were moving in a lot and they ate all the rodents and they ate all the, uh, the hares and, and uh, the smaller animals. So they all went away and when the wolves came back and took care of the coyotes and chased them away and uh, kept the elk and deer moving, then things started growing again and uh, it changed the whole landscapes escape and all the other animals came back too. So that's called a traffic cascade when it trickles down from the um, from the wolf down to the ground. But I'll tell you a little bit, I wanted to show you a little bit of the documentary I did about the Mexican gray wolves. And um, we have different subspecies um, of wolves. There's two different subspecies. Who has an idea which ones they are? There's only two subspecies. Uh, how about cutback? Do you have an idea what two subspecies of wolves there are? Rocky Mountain gray wolf. Yeah, there's the Rocky Mountain gray wolf. How about uh, Great Falls? Any idea? Is it the you say? I didn't catch that. The Mexican gray wolves, yeah, uh huh. So actually, there's only two subspecies: the red wolf and the gray wolf. Even the Arctic wolves, even if they are white, they are called the gray wolves. So we have the Arctic wolves, timber wolves, northern Rockies wolves. Um, we have the Mexican gray wolves, and we also have the um, the red wolves. But the red wolves have also become extinct, and they're very small, and they are more at the east coast. We don't have them up here. So anyways, the Mexican gray wolves are the smallest wolves. They are like the size of a German shepherd. And I'll show you, uh, I'll show you, um, here we go. That's about the size, here, I'll show you this one, that's better. That's about the size of a paw print of a Mexican gray wolf compared to my hand. The wolves up here are larger. And often you see um, much larger footprints when you when you um, when you're lucky, maybe in the spring, and they have been walking through the mud. So that's about the size of Mexican gray wolf paw print, and they are the smallest ones. They weigh about 75 pounds, like a German Shepherd, and they are also the most endangered ones. Right now, when I made the film a few years ago, we had about 50 in the wild. And right now we have about 75, 80 in the wild. So um, they are the most endangered land mammal in all of North America. And I wanted to help them a little bit um, and spread the word and write a new story about coexistence with wolves. So I started on the video. And I'm going to show you a part of it now. And then we have some time for questions and to talk about it some more. So this is part of Stories of Wolves that I made about three years ago. Thank you so much. the Wolf Nation for the past 200,000 years. The wolves have been here long before we came along and we have learned from them how to hunt and raise a family. They are very much like us. Now, for the first time in human history, something unprecedented is happening. Our wolves are in danger of becoming extinct. I grew up in Germany on an organic farm and we have a few little plots of land, maybe the size of a living room. He said, this is called the wolf trap. And my ears perked up and I got all excited and I said, where are they? Where are they? And he said, oh, he said, all proud. 
You know, don't worry about them. This is where our ancestors killed the last wolf, so you and I would be safe. But instead of feeling safe and feeling good about this, that's sad, and I, I said to him, how dare they have done that? Now I'll never meet them. I'll bring him back, I said to my grandpa. I'll bring him back, grandpa. And he looked at me like, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, good luck. You know, we worked so hard on exterminating them and now you want to bring him back? Why in the world would you want to do that? The Mexican gray wolf is uh, such an incredibly endangered animal. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has named it the most endangered land mammal in North America. In terms of, of our relationship to the wolves, we've often seen them as a threat to certain ends that we have. Wolves perhaps represent a dark nature, scary nature, uh, a vicious creature that we would fear. Again, we can see that as a relic of the past that's still with us, that some people are still identified with that old story and still doing harm. I had been wanting to do something for the wolves for a long time and aid in their recovery somehow and I didn't know what to do really and I was working in film at that time and I had a dream. That night I was in a very sterile building in my dream. It was all chrome and marble and metal and it was all shiny and there wasn't anything that I considered natural. No plants, all forced air, and no animals and I was really horrified and I was looking for the exit while everybody else in, in that building was saying, isn't that great? Isn't that a great feat of humanity to have created something like that? And I said, no, no, let me out. I need to be with the animals. I need to go outside. And as I was looking for the exit, I looked up and there was a screen on the wall and on the screen were the Mexican gray wolves and they looked down at me and they said, come and make your film now or else you'll only see us on screen anymore. <coughs> They once roamed freely all the way from Phoenix to Mexico City. Then the settlers came from Europe and killed almost all of them off in favor of livestock and out of fear. It was almost too late. When then President Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act into law in 1973, there were only five Mexican gray wolves left in the wild and two in captivity. We are lucky to have that law in place. It is their only way to survive. Only one wolf out of the seven was a female. These seven wolves are the ancestors of our wolves today. The five remaining wolves in the wild were trapped and put into an emergency captive breeding program. In 1998, some of their descendants were starting to be released back into the wild. Now we have about 50 wolves left in the wild in New Mexico and Arizona. They live in nine different families and some of them are alone. They are not out of the woods yet. They need you to make a stand for their survival. Why should you? And what makes a coexistence between livestock, humans and wolves possible? Why do we all belong in the web of life? My personal affiliation with the wolf is the fact that I have an appreciation of, of the wild. I think that predators have a place on the landscape. They serve a definitive function in terms of providing balance. If it was used by advocacy groups up front to discuss with the wider public why wolves matter, 
beyond just being wolves and, and having to exist on their own. I think that it can have an effect on people who might not necessarily care that much about wolves, but care about there being more balance right, in the ecosystem. Wolves make life better. Wolves in the wild make the land healthier. Aldo Leopold, right? <laughs> who many consider to be the founder of conservation or modern conservation thought in the United States, had his conservation epiphany in Arizona in what is now the heart of the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area, up above the Black River. You know, him and some buddies back in the early 1900s shot into a pack of wolves and thinking that eliminating wolves would create more deer and create a hunter's paradise. And after they shot into the wolves, Aldo approached one of the wolves and observed the green fire dying in her eyes and later realized that there was more to that and more to the wolves. Leopold later went on to, to elaborate on the importance of wolves as key ecological actors in balancing nature, keeping deer herds in check and helping the herds move across the landscape and in so doing regulating the time of exposure to plants which reduces overgrazing, which reduces erosion, which provides benefits to riparian areas and aquatic species and results in aspen and willow and cottonwood regeneration. And it's all tied to the wolves. And there's a lot more going on than that, but wolves are the key ecological actors in the region. And conservation biologists are just beginning to prove these theories today. So what's interesting is that it's still playing out right here in the Southwest, in ground zero for Mexican wolf restoration. And with the absence of wolves, we've seen what's called a sudden aspen decline, rampant throughout the American Southwest, and the disappearance of aspens and the severe and consistent degradation of our riparian areas and riparian woodland vegetation. And with the restoration of wolves in the northern Rockies, scientists are now able to demonstrate, to document the regeneration of aspens and willows and cottonwoods and a variety of ecological relationships or interactions which are restoring the resiliency and the diversity of natural systems. And it's a very complex equation, but the bottom line is wolves are key ecological actors and it's difficult to impossible to replicate the role that they play in balancing nature. So, thank you for watching. This is just a part of it, the introduction of the whole video that I did, but you got an idea of um, of what the Mexican gray wolves are going through. So, um, so what came to mind when I was watching this too is like how how interesting it is that the settlers came from Europe and brought with them the livestock and started killing all the wolves in the U.S. because what's now the U.S. because they believed that you could either have livestock or wolves either um, a garden or wild plants. So that's where they came from. And the interesting thing is that right now in Europe, and you have read the articles, right now in Europe, we are really trying very hard to bring these wild animals back. <laughs> After making huge efforts to kill almost all of them, we are bringing them back, not just the wolves, but also the wild bison. Did you all read the article on Bulgaria bringing, rewilding and bringing back uh, the wild bison? Yeah? No. Did you see that one? Yeah. So that was another one. Um, actually, our ancestors would have never survived without wild bison, just like the native people here. Way before we had cattle, that's what people relied on. They were, um, for uh, their survival, they were killing wild bison among other things, wild horses, wild bison, huge elk, that's what, what we used to have. And um, <coughs> without bison, we couldn't have survived. But then, at some point, we had the, our domesticated cattle, and we didn't want the bison anymore, and we thought we couldn't live with both. We either had to have bison or <coughs> cattle, and there was no chance to coexist. So, um, so last year in February, I was in Poland 
to film the last wild bison there. And there's a small herd in the south and a small herd in the north. There used to be about 700 left, but during World War II, the armies killed them all. I think maybe they ate them or they didn't want them around, but there were just a few left and people started a captive breeding program again. Do you all know what a captive breeding program is? Any ideas, uh, Kat Bank? Yeah. Yeah? Can you tell me? It's where they take wild animals into captivity and breed them to repopulate. Yes, and to release them later. Yes, very good. So they were doing that with the bison. They had only 52 left in wildlife parks and zoos, and they took them together and started breeding them again. And now we have a few wild herds in uh, Poland, in Russia, and even in Germany. Um, we have about 17 that sort of live in the wild in a huge enclosure, not in a small one, but in a huge enclosure. So they're even bringing, starting to bring the wild animals back. And they're starting to make an economy out of them. Did you read about uh, wolf tourism in Spain? How in that one area where there's lots of uh, wolves, uh, tourism has gone up because people are now wanting to see them. And they're traveling from all over Europe um, to go see the wolves in Spain. It's, is that anything that's happening in your area too? Do you see tourists that come just for the wolves, maybe? Up to Montana, how about Great Falls? Do you have any wolf tourism or people just coming for nature? Uh, a lot of people come to the Yellowstone, Yellowstone Park, yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I was there this summer and it was very interesting for me because you know, um, I would see people drive up and be totally distracted, and the minute they got out of the car and saw their first wild bison or first wild wolves, they were in awe. They stopped. I, I remember seeing one family where the kids were quarreling with each other, and they weren't paying attention to anything, but when they saw their first wild bison, everybody was like, oh my goodness, look at this. I've never seen this. I've driven all the way, we've driven all the way from Pennsylvania. So, um, so tourism to see wild animals has gone up significantly. And so the interesting thing is that the idea of killing wild animals came from Europe to the US, and Europe already had killed all their wild animals, basically. And they started doing the same thing here, and now there has been a turn in <coughs> consciousness almost, you know, like, oh wait, we have nothing left, we need to preserve it now. And actually the US, was the first one to the first country to pass the Endangered Species Act to protect um, animals from becoming extinct, and now we have the same in Europe. Now all of a sudden, people and countries who have before have really waged war on certain animals, they are now starting to protect them, and it's really great to see. And we even had a moose outside of Berlin. It's a, t it's a town with three and a half million people. <laughs> and just last year, a moose came all the way to the outskirts of that town, of that big city. And also some wolves are in the vicinity. So it's really interesting. And people are starting to learn again how to coexist with them. But it's very difficult because uh, they have lived without them for so long. What do you think would be one way to coexist with wolves? What could sheep herders and cattle uh, ranchers do to protect their cattle from wolves? Any ideas? Anybody doing that already on their ranch, for example? Do you have any ideas? How about cut bank? Putting out the fences. Fences, yeah. Yeah, what else? Do you think it would help to have somebody with the herds of, um, of cattle, like a range rider? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, in Europe, they're giving out fences to, um, to sheep herders because they have found that in free fence, they get free fencing if they put their sheep in an enclosure overnight. Because they have found that if the sheep are all together, the wolves will not attack them. 
But if a, sh a sheep is here, another one is over here, and they're all dispersed, they're much more vulnerable. But if they're together in a herd and they're not moving, um, they have a much better chance of survival. So they have, they have, they basically had very few uh, wolf attacks when they when they put the sheep in an enclosure overnight. Anybody ever heard of like the um, herding dogs, like the Great Pyrenees? Does anybody have dogs on their ranches? How about uh, Great Falls? No. That's also very effective. The, um, yeah? Excuse me? Yes. Yes? Does it work? Yeah, for the most part. For the most part? All right. Are the, are the dogs very protective of the cattle? Do you have them with cattle or with sheep? Cattle. Cattle. Are they very protective? Are they staying around them all the time? Awesome. Yes. So, yes. people are now making efforts to protect their livestock, whereas before they would just leave them in the forest uh, unprotected. Um, they are now making efforts with the fencing. They also, they also use something called flattery. Um, wolves do not like to jump over or go under something that moves, so they have flatteries. It's like little flags. It's like a fence made out of little flags that are swaying in the wind. And they've also found that even over long term, the wolves will not um, approach those fences. So uh, people are making efforts now again to protect their livestock from, um, from predators and wolves. And we have found that really works. Or some organizations in the Southwest, they're paying for range riders, like the old time cowboy, because that's also very difficult uh, for people to come up with the funding. So certain organizations are raising money for range riders and they're, um, they're paying for them and um, hiring them for certain ranchers that are in the area where the wolves are. So we have lots of, we have lots of efforts going on right now to coexist with wild animals again. And it's very exciting. It's a very exciting time. Also science is very, um, very active these days. This is a replica of a, a radio collar. I made it out of an olive jar and a belt. <laughs> um, I had one, but it's the same circumference and the same weight and the same size. Um, so they are radio collaring um, wolves and other large animals to really get an idea of how much they're moving, um, what their habits are, where we find them, and how migratory they are. And there is a great story of a wolf in Europe. His name is Slouts. And a friend of mine who's a biologist, he collared him in a country called Slovenia. And Slouts um, had a radio collar on that uh, st stayed there for 53 weeks. Then it fell off. It was designed to fall off. But for 53 weeks, people, scientists got to follow this particular wolf. And he was a disperser. He left his family in search of a mate and a territory. So he went from Croatia through Slovenia in December of 2011 and crossed the Alps at six feet of snow, this high, and went straight into Italy. And Italy still has about 600 wolves, and, um, and there's a town called Verona where they wrote um, Romeo and Juliet. And right outside of that town, he found the only female wolf in the whole area. So they named her Juliet, and the two got together and since he had a radio collar on, they could follow them. They didn't have puppies in 2012, but they had puppies in 2013. They're still together. The collar has fallen off since, so they have more privacy. But uh, luck, uh, hopefully, they'll, st they'll have puppies again this year. And uh, so having that radio collar on really helped people get a more personal um, connection to those wolves. They're even making a do documentary about them now, and um, they're called Slouts and Juliet, and they're quite famous in Europe now. So it really helps us 
write a new story and get from the big bad wolf to to a more personal story. And who has read the article on family values of wolves? Anybody? Yeah, great. Thank you. That's another thing um, <laughs> that um, that we are just now learning how loyal they are to each other and how they are. Um, they live in families. We call them a pack, but it's really a family. And the male and the female stay together for life. If, they, if it's intact and nobody dies, they mate for life. And they have two generations of their offspring with them usually. So any ideas how many puppies a wolf family has every year? How about cut bank? Five. Five is about the average. Two to seven. Mm -hmm. And um, Great Falls, what do you think? How how many of them um, percentage-wise die in the first year? If you have five puppies, how many of them will survive? The most likely. Two of me, yes. Mm -hmm. Mortality is very high among the wolves. So they didn't. They don't even. Half of them doesn't even make it through the first year, because it's very dangerous. And then, any ideas how long they live in the wild? An adult wolf who made it through the first year um, has a really good chance to live longer. But how long? Anybody? Thirteen. How long? Thirteen. That's more in captivity. Yes. In the wild, the average is lower. Who has an idea? Six. Nine. Six. That's a good guess. Seven. Yeah. Seven to eight years. Because it's very difficult for them to survive in the wild. It's a very hard life. And even as an adult, hunting is very dangerous. You have to be a very good hunter and be careful not to get kicked by deer or elk or moose or bison, especially bison. Most wolves don't hunt bison because they're too large. So, um,. So mortality is really high, and most of them don't even make it through the first year. So, um, so we don't really have wolves in the wild that live as long as like a dog. So, who knows about the relationship of the dog and the wolf? Cut bank. Any idea how they are related? Um, back in the day, they. Um and then they got, um, the Say that again. Say it again, they please. Got, they, got, they got domesticated. Yes, they got domesticated. Yes, correct. Yeah, so wolves have actually given us our best friend, the dog, because early native people would uh, probably take wolf cubs that were orphaned or a wolf that would follow them around for food. Um, and domesticate them and start domesticating a little, them a little bit. So actually our wolf, our dogs, our domesticated dogs have the wolves as, a, as an ancestor actually. They were evolving from the wolf. So actually our domesticated dogs are a gift to us from the wolves basically. And it's very interesting how, um, how we really like dogs and we really, a lot of us really don't like wolves because they're really, they really come from the same origin. So um, it's a very interesting story, um, the story of the, our wolves, but it's unfolding still because now we are learning so much more. And of those among you who were um, afraid of wolves at the beginning, is anybody still afraid of them? little bit okay yeah I looked at that too and I did a lot of research and I thought well how many people get killed every year by wolves any ideas in the US how many people get killed by wolves or attacked by wolves how about wolves? see that again Ten. Zero. Ten? it's usually it's zero and we have to uh, define that saying how many people get killed by a healthy wolf. Because sometimes there's wolf attacks in like Alaska where wolves have rabies. 
But it's, then it's the same as with dogs. And a friend of mine just got attacked by a rabid cat, actually, by a house cat who contracted rabies. So animals who have rabies always um, uh, are kind of like taken over by that virus and behave differently. But healthy wolves usually do not attack people. Any ideas how many people get killed by cattle in the U.S. every year? Five. Twenty. Yeah. 20 people get killed by cattle every year in the U.S. And usually it's their caretakers that want to give them a shot of antibiotics or, 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 take, or hurting them or taking their calves away. Uh, and again, that's kind of like an unfair statistics because there's so much more cattle than there are wolves. But just to give you an idea, because we had been taught in the past that wolves are these vicious creatures, but I couldn't really find any any evidence of a healthy wolf attacking a human. And the same in Europe. But stories usually get very blown up. I found a story once in Slovenia. It said, wolf stop train about to kill baby. And when I looked at the, sto uh, the story, I thought, well, how did they stop a train, you know? That was about 100 years ago. So I looked at the story, and what happened was people on a train saw some wolves in the distance. And a few miles down the road, they saw a woman walking with a baby. So they stopped the train, whisked the woman away into the train to save her baby from the wolves. And the story went, wolf stop train about to kill baby. <laughs> so we really, um, we really have been blowing up um, these stories with our imagination a lot. And so whenever I looked at that, yes. Whenever I looked at that, um, you know, I found usually there was no evidence um, behind, uh, there was really no, no meat behind that story, those stories. So we have a few more minutes for questions. I just got the <laughs> last minute <laughs> call here. Who has any questions for me? And please feel free to ask me anything. How about we start with Kat Ben? Any questions? I can start one out from a student who wasn't able to be here, but their question is, what is a solution um, when the wolf population exceeds more than the ecosystem can handle and the wolves start affecting humans and domestic livestock more and more? That's a great question. People think questions because people think that wolf populations just keep growing and growing and growing and they could explode, but it's actually the opposite. They're carnivores and if they would um, produce many litters, or, uh, uh, if they would, ex uh, they would um, grow a lot, then they would starve because they would be eating up everything that's around, all the deer and the elk. So wolves really have an inbuilt system. They only breed once a year. Mating season is around January, February. And after 63 days, the babies are born. And a female does not go into estrus if she doesn't have enough to eat. So if there's not enough to eat, they just don't breed. And usually in New Mexico, for example, I have found that wolves take down an elk within 200 yards of a of a herd of cattle. So they still prefer their natural prey. And if we separate the cattle um, and protect the cattle, they usually are um, safe from the wolves and predations are uh, going down a lot. So usually there is no wolf population explosion because of, of the balance between their food source and them. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Is there one from um, um, Great Falls? I was wondering if they were having any, any mutations from inbreeding because of the really low populations of the gray wolves, because they'd slimmed down so much and they came back. Are they having any mutations from that? That's a really good question. Again, it goes down to that uh, wildlife corridor thing. Because many places, you know, we want them to stay in Yellowstone or in Glacier. And, uh, but that doesn't work because they need to, um, they don't inbreed usually because um, they have an inbuilt um, sense about that. But they need new, fresh DNA coming in from other families. And often, we were just talking about that, when a wolf disperses and leaves their family in search of a mate, 
they are most vulnerable. Now they don't have their uh, protection, the, the protection of the, of the family, they don't know where they are, they don't have the protection of the territory, and they're very vulnerable. They often get poached or run over by cars, so um, you're right. What we really need to do is uh, work on um, work on corridors so that they can meet each other and they can move more freely. But usually there, there's no inbreeding. But their gene pool goes down if there's nobody and their, their numbers go down um, if, if there's no fresh DNA coming in. So that's a concern. That's definitely a concern. We need to make more room for them so they can move freely without being killed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, there's another one. Where did the chihuahua I've heard different things, uh, but not the wolf, I think. It's a different species, more like a fox-type species or something like that. It would be worth uh, doing some research on that. There's probably lots of things online, but I've heard that the chihuahua actually is one of the dog breeds that doesn't come directly from the wolf, but I'm not sure about that. So maybe you can do the, do the research and tell me about that. That would be great. I've been wanting to do that, but I haven't gotten around to that. So, any other questions? Oh, there's the bell. Another student was wondering, as the wolf population increases, do you see hunting laws for wolves becoming less strict? Yes, how is he? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, and they were thinking how, if the hunting laws become less strict, is there a way that you can recognize the alpha wolf and the pack so that they're not harvested? That's a very, very good question because what we've found right now is with the hunting them just by numbers, you know, like, okay, we can take 10 out here, two out here, and uh, we can extend hunting season. Often, the ones that get killed are the expert hunters. I call them the breadwinners. You know, like the mother or father of a family, the expert hunters. They're usually out hunting, and they're first in line, and so, and they're bigger, so hunters target them usually. And that's a real problem, because if you take those experienced guys out, the next ones in line are not in more inexperienced, and actually after a wolf hunt, depredations go up. In Europe, they did a study. After culling, they call it a culling of the wolf population, when you take wolves out and kill them, the depredation, the, the remaining wolves are more inexperienced, and they don't know how to take down a, 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 a very uh, fast elk, so they rather kill a sheep or a cow. So it's really very difficult um, if we just hunt wolves by numbers and we don't look at the whole structure of the family because it's very detrimental if you take out the main hunters. And uh, yes, we have seen it already the last few years. We have, uh, we have um, lifted the whole endangered species thing and wolves have been able to get hunted again and scientists say that's very difficult because right now we have a half a year hunting season here in Montana. It started um, September 15th and it's going till uh, Saturday, till the 15th of March. And it went all the way through mating season and uh, technically now the pregnant females can be killed. And they did three months of trapping them. It started December 15th and it goes through March 15th. And it's very difficult because it breaks up the family. If the mother or the father gets killed, nobody can take the place of that animal because they're all related and they don't inbreed. So if they don't get another uh, wolf in from a different family, that's not related, which is often very highly unlikely, 
because we don't have a wildlife corridor, then the family splits up and now they are very vulnerable again because they're all in search of a, of a new territory and they're not protecting each other and it's, it's very difficult. So, um, so hunting them and saying, okay, we will kill 200 and it doesn't matter who it is, is very difficult. Yes, you can usually see who the, we call them alpha, but I would say the most experienced and the oldest are because they're usually uh, bigger and they act differently. But, uh, but often hunters don't take the time to look at that. And it's, it's, I think it's more, it's felt to be more honor, honorable to kill a large wolf than a smaller one. So that's a difficult one uh, because we would have to, to talk to the hunters about them and train them more and, um, and give bigger guidelines. Right now, anything is possible with the hunt. So there's some photos around Yellowstone and Glacier, but that's it. Well, thank you for your thank you. attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That was your bell, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good job.